Welcome to Lambs to Lions. You're listening to the weekly podcast with Pastor Matt Funk. All right, guys. Well, welcome. Thanks for joining us this morning. We are in week three of our Battleship series, All Hands on Deck. Are we in week four? Is it week four? Yeah. 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 We are in week four of our series, Battleship, All Hands on Deck. (laughs) Okay, man, right on. Thank you. Last week, you know, Pastor Matt had just some messages. It's been so powerful. We've had an amazing time with God and all the messages and the worship. Last week, he was talking about call to action and getting in the boat, right? Serving God in his house. Today, we are blessed with Pastor Charmaine is going to be preaching today. And she's going to be preaching from Ephesians 6 on the armor of God. And so when I was asking the Lord, well, what would you like me to share with the men this morning, maybe in relation to that topic? And he said he would like me to focus on the breastplate of righteousness. Wow. So we're going to read from Ephesians 6. That's where we're going to start this morning, guys. We're going to read Ephesians 6, 14 again. It says, stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. What is the blessed pr- the breastplate of righteousness? It's a blessed the blessed plate. <laughs> <laughs> my first day with my new mode. <laughs> what is the breastplate of righteousness? So in the Apostle Paul's time, who wrote this uh, chapter, or the whole book of Ephesians, a typical armed soldier wore a, ble- a breastplate that was made of uh, bronze. Yes. Right? And it covered the vital organs, especially the heart, especially for the heart. Paul compares the armor of God with military gear. Each piece represents a part of God's strength that he gives to us when we get born again. The breastplate of righteousness refers to the righteousness that was purchased for us by Jesus at the cross. That's one of your blanks. God specially designed the breastplate to protect our heart and soul from evil and deception. Mm -hmm. The Bible says in Isaiah 64, 6, that our righteousness is like filthy rags. Our own righteousness acts are no match for Satan's attacks. Our own righteousness won't cut it. The breastplate of righteousness has Christ's name stamped on it, almost like Jesus is saying, your righteousness isn't sufficient to protect you. Here, wear mine. Mm. 2 Corinthians Chapter 5, verses 17 through to 21 reads this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ to have be reconciled to God. Verse 21, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That takes us to our first point this morning, a new beginning. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creature, one version says, or a new creation. The literal Greek of this verse says that he is a new species of being which never existed before. (laughs) That's interesting. A new species of being that never existed before. Jesus was the first. He was the firstborn. If you are in Christ, you have been completely recreated. The old life is gone and a new life has begun. Your spirit is completely reborn. When that happened for me, guys, everyone's experience is different. But in May 1st of 2011, when I... When I received Jesus as my Lord, it was like a nuclear explosion went off inside of me. I knew something supernatural had just taken place. I just knew it. I was different. I was completely. I didn't know any of the. I was a scripture illiterate. I didn't know that I had become a new creation, a new creature. It didn't take me long to find out that, but that's what happened to me. I walked out of that church. I've never seen the world the same since. Then it was. It's amazing. And I know all of you that have done that will know can can relate to that in one way or another. 
Verse 21 says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. As believers in Jesus Christ, we are the righteousness of God himself. Jesus is God. So what is righteousness? Righteousness is a legal term. It's actually an old English word. And it means to have right standing before God. That's a blank. Righteousness is a legal term, and it means to have right standing before God. According to the Vines Dictionary of Biblical Words, righteousness is defined as that gracious gift of God to men, whereby all who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ are brought into right relationship with God. We're in right relationship with him. In other words, your, your right standing before God is based upon, is based upon Jesus' right standing before God. So if you're born again, you are as righteous as Jesus. And why is that? Because your righteousness is from him. He purchased it for you at the cross. When you receive him as your Lord and Savior, he takes away all your unrighteousness once and for all. And he gives you his gift of righteousness. You cannot earn his righteousness through your right doing. It's not about what we do. It can only be received by your right believing in Jesus. That's a blank. You cannot earn his righteousness through your right doing. It can only be received by your right believing in Jesus. What we believe, guys, is important. That we need to be believing right. There is a question. What is the difference between those who have experienced their breakthroughs and those who are still trapped by toxic emotions and addictions? It's a simple, but it's a very powerful answer. Their beliefs. What are they believing? Right believing always produces right living. When you believe right, you will live right, not the other way around. You don't take a shower before you have a bath. <laughs> you just come to Jesus for the bow. People are struggling to control their behaviors and actions because they don't have control over their emotions and feelings. They don't have control over their emotions and feelings because they don't have control over their thoughts. And they don't have control over their thoughts because they are not controlling what they believe. If you believe wrong, you will struggle with wrong thoughts. Those wrong thoughts will produce unhealthy emotions. They're going to lead to feelings of guilt, shame, condemnation, and fear. Those wrong feelings will ultimately produce wrong behaviors, wrong actions, and painful addictions. Right believing comes from renewing our mind with the word of God, which, which is simply believing what God says about us and our circumstances. That's really what it is. That's what faith is. It's really quite simple. It's believing God wrote it. God said it. I believe it. End of story. Brings us to our second point this morning, guys. Change the way you think. Romans 12, 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Uh, the NLT version, I really like the NLT version of this scripture. It says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. Don't be doing what everyone else is doing, right? But let God transform you into a new person by, here it is, changing the way you think. We cannot just empty our minds. We have to replace a thought with a thought. We need to replace unhealthy thoughts with the Word of God. There are many people who don't realize that the reason they're not happy and the reason they're not enjoying life is because they've trained their minds in the wrong direction. They've trained it. They've trained their minds to worry. They've trained their minds to complain. They've trained their minds to see the negative. But just as you can form these negative mindsets, you can retrain your mind according to the Word of God and form godly mindsets. That's When I got saved, that scripture was the one that jumped out at me like a neon light. Renew your mind. Renew your mind. I knew My mind was a mental mess at that time. At 46 years of age, uh, my mind was a mess. And I got into that word and <laughs> started replacing that old stuff, just getting it out and putting God's truth in. Just that, that was, man, I was on a mission 
to, to get that changed. And uh, it's taken time, but you know, over the over the years, now I look at the world and the way people talk and think it they, they seem nuts to me. It's like totally uh, 180 from it, God's words, not 180 from the world. It's the other way around. The world is 180 from Him, right? <clears throat> so we can replace our worldly, unhealthy thoughts with new healthy thoughts. God's thoughts, and God's thoughts are His word. So if you'll think his word, that's a blank. If you'll think his word, you'll think his thoughts. And Romans 12, 2 calls that process the renewing of your mind. It also says that the process of renewing your mind will transform you. So why does it have such a dramatic effect? And this is the reason. Because when you change your mind, you change your choices. And that, gentlemen, changes everything. When you begin to dwell on the Word of God, the first thing you discover is just what I said earlier, is that the Word is completely opposite to the way you are used to thinking. But the only way for the Word to abide in you is to choose it over your old worldly thoughts. You choose. The Bible says, God said, choose, I put before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Choose life. It's up to you. You have to make that choice. And you have to be intentional. So the Bible calls those old thought patterns strongholds. And it tells us that we have to overthrow them with the word of God. 2 Corinthians 10.5 For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. How do you take your old thoughts captive and bring them to the obedience of Jesus? You do that by replacing them with his thoughts and his words. If you're going to be abiding peace of God, and if his word is going to abide in you, you have to close the door to all other kinds of thoughts. Now, if you're a door dasher like I am, this scripture is one that I use daily <laughs> when I'm out there. Right? Because I get thoughts when people are fingering me and doing all kinds of stuff like that. I'm at McDonald's one day in Vetter, and I pull in, you know, and I'm going to get my order, and there's a guy standing there by his motorcycle, right? I walk in, I'm like, that dude standing there minding his own business by his motorcycle. That's what I thought. And I go in there, and I get my order, and I get back in the car, and I start to back out, right? And then there was a truck that had come in, and I didn't see him right away, and it stopped. And, you know, we kind of both had to do this stop thing, right? The guy in the bike goes... To me, nice backup, f bomb head. <laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> oh, yeah, the old man starts poking his head up out of the grave. Oh, you talking to me? <laughs> like, uh -huh. You better go lay hands on that boy. <laughs> and then when you're finished, lay hands on him again to, for his healing. <laughs> well, that's what's going through my head, right? So immediately I'm like, no, I just instantly, no, you know what? I cast down these imaginations in the name of Jesus. I don't know what's going on in that guy's life. I don't know what's happening with him. Yeah. Immediately, I'm not against, I'm not fighting against flesh and blood, okay. right? Wow. We're fighting against spiritual forces. Oh. So I immediately took that thought captive. Immediately, and you, you guys, you have to speak to it. You cannot fight thoughts with thoughts. You have to speak. And if Jesus said, whoever should say to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea. You've got to talk to him, man. Now, at first, it seems a little strange if you're not used to that. But God's ways are higher than our ways. And if you keep practicing this thing, over time, it'll just become a natural. It'll just come right out immediately. Would it, Ali, the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. I've been filling my heart with the word of God for 13 years, and that's what came out of my mouth. Not... <laughs> Park, get out. <laughs> you know, that's not what happened. I took control of that thought. I cast it out and I replaced it with God's thought. And then I blessed that guy. I prayed for him and I said, Lord, bless that man. Something broke, man, right there. It broke. Don't let don't let those thoughts in. You can't stop a bird from flying over your head, but you can stop him from landing on it. Right? You can keep him from landing there. Okay. So you got to cast down every thought that disagrees with the word and choose. Here we go. It's choose to think God's thoughts instead. You literally have to select what your mind thinks. You need to think on purpose. 
When the devil comes around with a thought of anxiety or disaster, we need to resist those thoughts and we need to tell him, that's not my thought and I am not touching that thought with my thought life. Get out now in the name of Jesus, right? And replace it with something from the word. And the Bible shows us what to think. The word says to think on things that are true, things that are noble, things that are right. To think on what is ever pure, lovely, and admirable. To think about things that are excellent or praiseworthy. The, the word shows us what to think about. If you think like the world thinks, eventually you will act like the world acts. Yeah. Right? If you think like God thinks, eventually you're going to act like God acts. Unrestrained thoughts produce unrestrained actions. So guys, control your thoughts by bringing them into the obedience to the scriptures. We're going to go over to Ephesians 2, verses 8, 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. This is one of your blanks. Our forgiveness is not based on us. Our forgiveness is not based on us. It is not based on what we have or what we do not or what we have not done. You cannot earn forgiveness through your own efforts. It is a gift. That's a blank. It is a gift. It's only through faith in Jesus' finished work at the cross that we receive the gift of salvation. You don't work for or you don't earn a gift. Otherwise, it's not a gift. A gift is something that is given to you. And Jesus gave his own life to ransom yours. And when you receive his gift of righteousness, the Bible says that those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. And guys, when you reign... Your addictions don't. When you reign, sickness and disease won't. When you reign, poverty can't. When you reign, fear, depression, and every obstacle that is blocking you from living your life to the fullest will be torn down. Come on. Right? Come on. Praise Jesus. Now, you might be thinking, and I've thought this many times, I don't deserve forgiveness. And you know what, guys? The truth of it is, none of us do. We deserve punishment for all the sins we have committed and will commit in our lifetime. That's what we deserve. We deserve death. But Jesus took death for us and gave us eternal life. He took what we deserve and gave us what we didn't deserve. That is why we are saved by grace. His unmerited, his unearned, and his undeserved favor through faith. So if you struggle with whether you deserve to be blessed, favored, and victorious, you're asking the wrong question. The question should be out, you should be asking is, does Jesus deserve to be blessed, favored, and victorious? Well, yes, he does. Absolutely. Because if you are in Christ, having a blessed future is not dependent on how much you strive to be perfect or how hard you work at changing yourself. It is only dependent on the person of Jesus. In 1 John 4, 17, it says, As he is, so are we in this world. This is the scripture that got me through university. Well, Jesus is intelligent. As he is, so is he. And so am I in this world. But I'm intelligent. I went on from there. Right? Does Jesus deserve to be blessed, favored, and victorious? Well, as he is, so are we in this world. Then so do you. What verse is that? 1 John 4, 17. This is what being in Christ Jesus means. It means that today, God assesses you and sees you based on the perfection of Jesus Christ. His righteousness is your righteousness. And we already read in verse 21 that because Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin for us, we are now the righteousness of God in Christ. Guys, righteousness is not about right doing. Righteousness is about right believing. Tradition and religion have confused righteousness with holiness. Religion says that righteousness is the way you act, but that is not true. Holiness is your conduct. Righteousness is what you are. 
We don't get in right standing with God by being good and acting right. We get there through faith in the finished work of Jesus at the cross. When you get born again, your spirit is completely reborn, but your soul, your mind, will, and emotions, and your body are not. So this is why we need to renew our minds with the Word of God and use the Word to control our bodies. And this process is called sanctification. That's a blank. This process is called sanctification, which brings us to our third point this morning. The fuel for right living. The fuel for right living. Hebrews 10, verses 12 and 14. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. For by one offering he has perfected forever, and that's all, forever's forever, those who are being sanctified. It's a process. This verse says that when you receive Jesus, you are justified and made righteous by his blood, and you are perfected forever. Sanctification, on the other hand, is an ongoing process in your growth as a Christian. The scripture says that we are being sanctified, even though we are perfected forever by Christ's one act of obedience to the cross. So as a believer, you cannot become more righteous, but you you, you can become more sanctified or holy in terms of how you live your life. Justification by faith happens instantaneously the moment you receive Jesus. In that moment, you are forgiven, cleansed, perfected in righteousness, and saved. You are also sanctified in Christ. That's Hebrews from Hebrews 10.10. Sanctification in Christ is progressive. The more you grow in your relationship with the Lord Jesus, the more holy or sanctified you will become in every area of your life. Now, the Merriam-Webster Online Dictionary describes sanctification as this, the state of growing in divine grace as a result of Christian commitment after conversion. So it's all about growing in grace. We need to establish ourselves in the gospel of grace. Paul told Timothy to be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. That's 2 Timothy 2.1. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. In his last epistle, Peter encouraged believers to build a strong strong foundation, and he said, Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's 2 Peter 3.18. It is the the grace, it is grace that produces true holiness. The more you grow in grace, the more you are washed over and over by the water of the word of God's grace. The more you are washed by the word, the more you grow in sanctification and holiness. The more you grow in sanctification and holiness, the more you allow the Holy Spirit to correct habits and stinking thinking Mm -hmm. that keeps you in bondage. When you experience the grace of our Lord Jesus, the draw to the temporary pleasures of sin will dissolve in the light of his glory and grace. It will set you free to have the kind of relationship that you desire to have with God, a relationship that is intimate a relationship that is powerful, a relationship that is full of peace, joy, and good fruit. So our takeaway this morning, guys, receive the gift of righteousness and reign in life. Receive the gift and reign in life. Right? Yeah. Come on, man. We, we obviously, we get the better deal, uh, uh, right? It's amazing. First Corinthians 15, 17, uh, it says that if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, but man also came, but by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in, Ad, as in Adam all die, even so in Christ, all shall be made alive. So the Apostle Paul is saying that Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead. And because he is risen, you are no longer in your sins. The resurrection of Jesus is the living proof that all your sins have been completely and totally forgiven. Past, present, and future. The Apostle Paul wrote and tends in Romans 10, verses, verses uh, 9. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, 
you will be saved. Gentlemen, I want to give you an opportunity right now, if you haven't done that, to do that. To receive Jesus as your Lord. And maybe you have done that in the past. But you've gone your own way. You've been doing things your way. And you've had enough. And you want to come back. I want to give you that opportunity right now to do that. So let's all bow our heads. Let's close our eyes. And let's pray this prayer together as brothers. Pray with your whole heart. Pray loud enough that you can hear it with your own ears. So let's go. Dear God, Dear God, God I know that I have sinned. I know that I have sinned. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. I confess Jesus as Lord. Confess Jesus as Lord. And I believe that God has raised him from the dead. I believe that God has raised him from the dead. I am now a believer. I am now a, believer. I am now a child of God. Fill me now to overflowing with your Holy Spirit. I thank you for it. Thank you for it. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for tuning in today, and thank you for continuing to partner with us and for giving so generously to this ministry. If you would like to find out more about how you can partner with us, visit our website at www.wherepeoplematter.church and click the giving link. And don't forget to subscribe and share this with your friends. See you next time.